I've been trying to make this video for a while and I'm going to uh, uh, in the background I'm I'm working on some angels uh, an unusual angel an astronaut angel how can an astronaut be an angel because the uh, suit the astronaut suit would prevent from the wings to be able to come out you figure it out I have no idea somebody else can do it but anyway I'm gonna do this video on the most irrelevant art being produced as I look out oh I'm looking out now I hadn't noticed but the chemtrails are major major chemtrails in our environment uh, we are such <laughs> we are so under threat you know, and people who are still sitting on the sidelines saying, oh, it's no big deal. I'm looking outside. I see the fucking chemtrails. And uh, how could anybody not look up into the sky? Anyone that is connected to the landscape, to the earth, to the sky, to the water, to the birds, to the animals, to each other, and look out and say, why are all those weird stringers going across the uh, heavens? Uh, these are unusual. It's not. It's not a vapor trail from a plane. It's something that stays there. Anyway, I'm going to do something. Uh, I'm going to do the chemtrail of art, which is an artist that I that I'm going to uh, dissect a little bit called Jeff Koons, a reptile, a reptile that is part of the culture of death. And uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to try to show you how this person, I'm, I'm having a very hard time listening to this person speak because it's the antithesis of life. They come across like beings of concern and interest in you and me, but they're really concerned about their own image, promoting themselves promoting their friends yeah they actually may i don't think they actually have friends they have it's sort of like reptiles they always have to watch their friends may want to eat them at any moment but anyway this is uh a dissertation on the most irrelevant art being produced and there are always artists that are promoted through history a good example of this uh of an artist who was not promoted who should have been promoted, uh, someone like Cezanne. Cezanne attempted for 20 years to be included in the Salon in Paris, a major exhibit every year in Paris. All the major artists uh, uh, had their due. No, actually, I wouldn't say all the major artists were included. They were, but not in the big Beginning. It was like a pressure for these for these people who are judges on this to include people anyway the story about Cezanne is that he tried to be included in the Salon in Paris in the 1800s 18 what was 1880 to 1900 whenever and he was rejected 21 times 20 times? 21 times. I think 20 times. And the 21st time he applied to be included in the Salon, Paul Cézanne, the father of modern art, was included in the Salon in Paris, but because one of his students, who was a juror, somebody that adjudicated the work, had the privilege as being one of the five or six jurors to pick an artist aside from what the other people thought. He could add an artist to the show and he picked Cezanne because he understood he was a student. He understood that Cezanne was amazing, but this is how it works. The art in our age is ignored, made fun of, and I'm going to make fun of the most irrelevant art, the art of Jeff Koons, Damien Hirst, but I'll pick on Jeff Koons right now. And I'm trying to listen to an, a video, an interview with a guy called uh, 
what's this guy called? Uh, uh, Pharrell, uh, a guy, some some black dude with a hat uh, that does interviews, and I'm not sure where they do it. He wants to be very cool. They're very casual. They're sitting in these uncomfortable chairs. If I was interviewed, I want to sit in a comfortable chair. It's really unpleasant. And uh, halfway through the interview, a naked girl comes and serves them water. It's not even a glass of wine or a good scotch. Uh, these guys are pretending to be some sort of esoteric Buddhist on the mountain and drinking water. And a girl that's completely stark but fucking naked serves them water. Now, what does that mean to you? If you were sitting somewhere being interviewed, of course, these are artists or people that are connected to the meaning of the universe in the most immediate moment of every moment and a naked girl comes out. What does that say to me? Now you need to be honest with yourself. You're dressed sitting at a table and a naked girl comes and serves you water. What does that mean? It means that we still have this concept that art, the way these two are representing art, consider women to be chattel. And to be naked means to be vulnerable. If I was walking around naked, I would feel vulnerable. I am shy. I have a feeling of reserve. And this girl that comes out, a beautiful woman, exposes herself and these guys pretend that she doesn't even exist. It's like the Pharaoh with the concubines. This is part of this video. I will attach a link. And now I'll just play a little bit and you'll see what I mean by what I've been going on about the culture of death and the most irrelevant art being produced. I'm a little juiced at the moment because it was so hard to watch this. It was really difficult to watch this. And Jeff Koons actually, I was down in Vegas with my buddy Padraig Cormac, McCormick, and we looked at a sculpture by Jeff Koons, the tulips, $36 million. I talked to Blanche and he said, Ackerman, what are you talking about? $36 million. They, pr they promote their work. He, he says that this was sold for $36 million when in fact it was probably like a couple of million bucks, which is a lot of money. But certainly not 36 million dollars because this is how this culture of death works it's promotion it's self-promotion and jeff coons has a sculpture called the tulips in the wind casino the wind casino where a lot of people come and spend uh blanche said they spend on average three thousand dollars a guest a guest for whatever amount of time they spend four or five days that's incredible that's why he can buy the work and blanche said to me you know that win is virtually blind or completely blind he can't even see what he buys so he bought this sculpture supposedly for thirty six thousand dollars from an artist called jeff coons the artist in the culture of death he he is the epitome of the culture of death and I'm going to go in through, okay, I should go through this now and dissect this a little bit. Let's see what Jeff Koons has to say at four minute and 10. Let's see if I can go there. Okay. It is, you know, a lamp would just be there. And so uh, I think my involvement with the ready-made comes from uh, also looking at uh, objects, ashtrays, uh, things in his showroom and just kind of picking up on their own little voice in a way of uh, of displaying what they were all right so he he invokes the idea of ready-made which of course is the uh the pinnacle in a sense of the duchamp work duchamp marcel duchamp made ready-mades which were discarded ignored they were considered to be stupid ugly things that nobody was interested in for 30 or 40 years and then all of a sudden a person like jeff coons refers to his art as ready-mades isn't that interesting he she, he is using the marcel duchamp the uh one of the uh pioneers of what we would consider 
uh, of, the, of the, the 20th century artists, one of the main uh, 20th century artists, uh, referring to his work as ready-mades. And of course, the ready-mades were a reference to the idea that Duchamp, as an artist, could designate the value of an object that he called a ready-made as art. Duchamp would say, this is art. I'm an artist. I say, what's art? So a ready-made became art. And in the, in the genre of contemporary pop culture, the culture of death, someone like Jeff Koons refers to ready-mades as part of his art. He doesn't say, thank you, Marcel Duchamp. He just calls it a ready-made, assuming that people who don't have a clue about Duchamp would know about a ready-made. Well, he is just absorbing this influence and trying to benefit from it. And of course, his ready-mades are not ready-mades. They are produced by factories who have workers, who are skilled workers, who know what their material means. He hasn't got a clue about what his material means. He is a propagator of ideas, ideas that have no relevance to our survival, which I will get into. Jeff Koons is a charlatan. He is the artist, an artist of death and hate and destruction that which we embrace at this moment in time. Like Madonna, we embrace Madonna. Brad Pitt, the stars, he is a star. He is a star that produces what is called art, but it's not really art. Art in the sense that I, as a painter, practice art. Kevin Blanche, Padraig McCormick, Linda Sauer, people who are Artists of conscience producing work. This is not an artist of conscience. He is a self-promoter. He's producing work in order to aggrandize himself, the I, not the we, the I. I'm going to go on to the next part. Let's see what I have is 440. Let's see what he says. Like when they're part of an ensemble of like a room, we walk right past them. But when those things are singular and by themselves, you cause a perceiver to look at it again. Look at the dimensions again. Look at the texture. Look at the color. I've always been an admirer of like your ability to single out an item and give it its uh, angular and dimensional just do. I think what people... Angular and dimensional just do do this Pharrell charlatan little knob. He's like a knob. He's a brain knob. He's like a growth on the end of a gnat stick. He's like a meaningless analysis. He's, he is a critic of, he is a sycophant for this, for this artist. And he's talking about the, the language, the angular, what was it? The angular drive? something in Kuhn's work, an angular something or other. There is a, an elaborate language always created around meaningless concepts. These are all meaningless concepts. And ultimately the meaninglessness of this work is that they never address the most important part of our time, the most important significant event of our time at this point, Fukushima, the complete and utter destruction of our planet. Of course, they miss it. They miss it. And this is my, this is the prerequisite of my analysis of this artist who misses the most important part of what it is we're experiencing at this point in time. He never brings it up in this 30-minute uh, interview with this little sycophant Pharrell naked women running through the set serving water to the oligarchs. We are beyond this as a race, as human beings. We need to get in touch with that which has meaning and value to each single one of us. The relationship we have with each other, not some arbitrary construct like this person is trying to attempt, successfully has attempted, 
successfully, he has succeeded in creating an aura around his work with the help of a lot of other people, like the gallery called the Gagosian Gallery, another reptile on this planet, who promote the culture of death. They have promoted this person. And he is talking about art as though, uh, the, the, the interesting part in this for me is that he uses words that actually have meaning and relevance to me. Like he says at times, people matter. Of course, to him, people are the least relevant part in his art. They have no significance because he doesn't talk about Fukushima. If people did have relevance, he would look to, he would find the most relevant part, the most relevant aspect, the most relevant crucial event in the, in the history of humanity called Fukushima. Now he never mentions it. Now I know he's not interested in you or in me. Let's see what he has to say about the avant-garde. He actually says something about the avant-garde part of the dialogue part of the fabric you just you, you just like the language dialogue the fabric these universal words participate that's what i always loved about the avant-garde yeah. the idea of the avant-garde uh, it was really that you know you could change your life and uh, it was about people uh, interacting together people like the avant-garde is about people interacting together what a bunch of fucking hooey that is it has nothing to do the avant-garde is sipping pina coladas on the beach it has nothing to do the avant-garde is trying to run away like him with a huge windfall of money which is meaningless ultimately what is money going to do in his value in his value as a person how does he relate to people he's divorced he's got kids he's got a fucking miserable life with his relationships and he's talking about people interacting he hasn't got a clue what it means to interact he is spouting the philosophy of nothing this is the art the philosophy of nothing with words that occasionally resonate with people. They're attracted to this. He has this alligator smile all the way through. He'll say something like, oh, you know, I, uh, I, I want to say that. Mm, and he has a smile on his face. And then this, this kind of, this, this Teflon appearance. He is a Teflon man. He is slippery. He's incredible. I look at this guy's face. I'm looking and I, I get terrified. I would run away. I would run away from this kind of person. And people are embracing the, the, the winds, the, the winds of this world, the, the collectors, the Margolis, the people that buy art are gravitating to this language because they're promoted. It's not because people understand what this person is doing. He is, he is the epitome of the, uh, of the destruction of our souls. Let's see what else I have. Self-acceptance and uh, the self-acceptance part. Okay, let's have a look at this. This is at uh, 12 minutes and something. 12 minutes and, uh, okay, let's go to 12 minutes. Bye. That should be like people's daily affirmation, what you just said. What differentiated your work from what was really popular in the 80s? Well, that's, that's hard to say because there's a lot of, you know, there's fantastic work being made all the time and every artist has a kind of a different voice in their work and it all comes together as one. And, you know, I'm, I love <laughs> everything. Uh, sure. Uh, I would say that with my work, I think that it was, uh, trying to tell a narrative and that the work was about, I think, transcendence of the self and uh, self-acceptance and uh, through self-acceptance, uh, you're able to start to go outward in this. He hasn't got a clue. He's just sort of like trying to dig up shit in his mind. Self-acceptance. This is the mantra of this age, self-acceptance. Don't accept yourself unless there is value. You have to work for it. It's not like just because you're alive, self-acceptance. In this age, the age we're living in, the age of fission, we need to scrutinize ourselves to, to such an extent to overcome what it is that we're facing. 
We're facing total annihilation. And this person is talking about some Buddhist mantra about self-acceptance. That's not how it works. You need to criticize, you need to put in the work, and then look at what you produce and say, have I lived up to my own expectations or what is demanded of me? He doesn't talk about that as like, oh, love yourself unconditionally. Well, yes, of course. We have to love ourselves unconditionally, but not the part of us that's fucked up. We're fucked up, we're fucked up. And he's saying, love the fucked up part no matter what. No, that's like Ted Bundy or Manson. You say to yourself, well, I'm a real asshole, but I'll love myself no matter what. No, you're self-critical. And this is the art of the lack of criticism. He is just producing work that has been absorbed, that is actually representing exactly that, what the oligarchs want him to produce. And he's just a vehicle, he's a nobody. He'll be ignored in the future, it'll be seen as irrelevant. And the footnote that will be Jeff Koons will be because he was so lauded as the end all and be all. He was the Zezan of the 21st century uh, because he was a charlatan. The charlatan that actually made himself appear so important, well, with the help of people like Agosi and all these other galleries. What else have I got here? Okay, this, this, this is a brutal one at 14 minutes of this. Uh, let's, let's have a look here. You know, I, I believe in uh, a lot of those works. And... Uh... Oh, he's talking about his divorce with this woman called Ilona somebody, an Italian woman that he had a relationship with for the sake of his art. They promoted themselves as fucking, fucking on stage. They would, they would reduce the act, the, the making love to your partner was ex exposed and exhibited like pornography. He was the pornographer of art. He, pr he produced works of art that included his so-called love of his life at the time, Elona, Italian woman. She became a member of parliament. She was a porno star. So this culture of death promotes, oh, this is quite, what, it, what, what is that? What is that? You love someone and you do it, it's very private, it's personal. But no, as an artist, of course, he had to produce this as an event. This is what he's talking about. And of course, well, am I surprised they divorced? Some ugly fucking divorce? And he had to destroy all the work that was related to this woman, his relationship? He's actually exalting this in some format, saying that this was important as part of his work. Well, it documents the decrepitness how completely deranged this person is, and we, have, we accept this as someone who is important to us in terms of art. Art has been destroyed by this person. Let's see what he has to say about this relationship. So yes, I'm sad that I uh, destroyed some of the work, but at the time- He's not sad, he, he couldn't deal with this relationship on a personal basis. He says that, oh, people are important in his life. Well, here's a person that supposedly was important and he's all, he's thinking that in this divorce, he, he was, he had to destroy this work that he was really attached to because he didn't want to give her the money from this or it was in dispute and he was gonna shaft her and say, you fucking bitch, I hate you and I'm gonna destroy the work that you have claim on because we were related, we were in a relationship. So he destroys the work, this brilliant work that he loves, but oh no, he won't let this work live in, for humanity because it's so important. No, he'll destroy it and he regrets destroying it, but not really because he's got all the money he wants and he destroyed this work because he hates this person. He is, a, he is part of the culture of hate. He can't relate. He can't have a relationship and solve whatever differences they might have. I have fights with my partner. I have fights, but I resolve it because it's important to resolve it because I love this person. And he says he had to destroy important parts of his art. Let's see what he has to say. I felt that I could try to protect my son's uh, environment that he would grow up in. And so uh, I feel sorry, sorry for the, the sons. There's some of my favorite works. Uh, I made a painting alone as asshole. It's uh, it has a nice dialogue with Corbet's origins of the world. Oh my God. Okay, fine. He painted 
a painting of Alona's asshole. Now this means people, you won't understand this unless you understand he refers to Corbet. And Corbet did a magnificent painting of a female nude. There was no head in this nude, it was her body, a luscious, voluptuous body with the genitals, the female genitals exposed for everyone to see. This was a brilliant painting because up until Corbet, there was a the, the Poussin kind of art ruled. The idea of the classics in terms of Roman culture, Greek culture, the gods, ref, biblical references. Painters were always induced, were forced to paint images that related to religion, to the church, to classical culture. Corbet said, fuck you. I'm not interested in that shit. I'm going to paint what's important to me, the woman I love. I'm going to paint the woman I love in the way I love this person. He expressed it was the most sexual, sensual image ever painted in the history of art. And of course, Goya, my one of my favorites, the Olympia paintings. Was it Olympia? Well, no, that's not her name. Uh, Olympia, that was Cezanne. The, uh, he, he copied that. Goya painted uh, the uh, Maya, the, the Maya, the desnudo, the nude Maya. And Courbet said, let's exalt this feeling of femaleness in our life, this life-giving feeling, the female genitalia, the, the beauty, the, the sensual beauty of this. And now this charlatan refers to having painted Ilona's, Ilona's his girlfriend's asshole. Now he's going to try and relate his work to Courbet, one of the most brilliant artists in the history of art history, the father where everything begins to change. We have Impressionism and we have Cubism, we have Dada, we have everything after Courbet. He's trying to align himself with this, with this artist, with this painter by saying, now you heard him say this, he painted Alona's ass and it's, it's in reference to the real world. Of course, you can, you can formulate this whichever way you want and come out on the other side saying, oh, isn't that a great idea? But we're not, we're not part of a system of ideas and aesthetics to try and dissect aesthetics. We're in our, the fight of our lives. Fukushima is raging and this little piece of shit in a bucket is talking about painting an asshole. Well, it's the asshole that we're actually experiencing. This part of culture that is destroying us from its very roots and these insidious, insidious individuals try to promote and exalt the, the rottenness of the rottenness part of us by saying, I painted her asshole. And of course, a lot of oligarchs, they're chuckling. <laughs> they're loving this. They're loving the fact that this little, uh, this little nerd that they paid off for millions and millions of dollars and he's sitting with his alligator smile saying to himself, I'm an exalted being. I am so enlightened. I'm painting the asshole of my girlfriend. Now I'm open to everything. I'm open to, I'm open to painting the asshole of something, but not in the context that he is promoting himself in this situation. I'm not sure how I can explain this. This is what I'm, this is what I, this is what I rile against. This is the nature of our un doing. This is why we have Fukushima and nuclearism, because of people like this, who he is irrelevant. The fact is that the oligarchs, the people that have money, promote this person. And of course, nobody, if I would say Jeff Koons to you, you wouldn't have a clue. You wouldn't know. It's because he's irrelevant. But in the sense of art, literature, music, the things that are very close to us, he's destroying the essence of our being by saying, by relating the Courbet topic. You don't know Courbet and what's involved here. This is so destructive, people. This is so destructive, what this person is doing. Let's see what he has to say about Masaccio, one of my favorite artists, Drew Masaccio. Work 
I was trying to, I saw uh, the painting by Masaccio, The Expulsion. Mm. And it's where uh, Adam and Eve are being uh, thrown out of the garden. And there's such guilt and shame on their faces, you know, uh, this uh, Masaccio painting. So I wanted to make a body of work that would help remove that kind of guilt and shame. And Okay, there's always a body of work connected to something. Uh, the body of work that he produces is actually not produced by him, it's someone else now. There is a factory behind this person, but aside from that, never actually, I would recommend to all of you that are interested in art, never buy any work that had more than two or three people involved in making it. There is, there is the destruction of the work in itself, that we industrialize the work. Anyway, he talks about Masaccio, and who he invokes here is someone of such enlightenment the epitome of art, uh, he is uh, Chiambui, Masaccio, Giotto. These are artists prior to the Renaissance, prior to where we, we took a detour. We took a detour and I'm going to pay attention or let's, I am going to unfold, expose the direction that was taken after Masaccio and Giotto was the wrong direction. And he now invokes Masaccio one of the most brilliant artists in Western art, in Western history, and he refers to the biblical notion of shame. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. There is no point in feeling shame because it's a secondary emotion. And he is right to invoke shame as a secondary emotion. However, in the context of the work that he does, it is the most shameful work ever produced in the history of, of art. To, to paint his girlfriend's asshole. And I suppose he would say, I'm highlighting the idea that I'm no longer restricted by the mores, by my own personal feeling of irrelevant, the irrelevant feelings I might have about my, my body, my nature, who I am, the idea of Shame. He invokes the idea of shame. Masaccio, when he painted the expulsion from the garden, not, not did he only not consider shame as part of this. And I'm going to, I'm going to refer now to a Blanche quote. And that was what he said, which is brilliant, that comes from Steinbeck, is Tim Schell. Now, of course, somebody like Coons wouldn't have a clue about Tim Schell. The idea thou mayest. It was the recognition. It wasn't a shameful thing. Is that shame is a secondary emotion. Tim Shell, the idea of thou mayest, has to do with choice. It is the recognition that we can choose. And if you look at this Masaccio painting, we have now, Masaccio is the precursor to Fukushima. Someone who knew, unless we choose properly and rightfully, we are sunk. This ship is sunk. Now, this guy wouldn't have a clue about this. He would have no idea. He calls it shame. This is the superficial version of Masaccio. Masaccio is about be two beings. And I'm not going to go into the biblical story because I have my own understanding of this, which has nothing to do with the story about Adam and Eve in the garden. The Garden of Eden hasn't happened as far as I'm concerned in interpretation, biblical interpretation, but it certainly was not shame. And he's referring to people in day-to-day -day life. Yes, we see ourselves and we feel ashamed. Well, the, it's, a, it's an insignificant emotion when you put it when you put it alongside of we choose, we choose, we choose, and what have we chosen? We've chosen Fukushima and nuclearism. For example, the most important issue of our time, and he calls it shame. Well, it's not shame. And artists like this deflect us from what it is that we need to look at. I, I'm going to end this now because... I, uh, you know, if you want to research this uh, person, he's in the mainstream media. He's all over the place with his uh, glossy, glitzy, ugly work. It's of no significance. It will be irrelevant in the future. If Wynn actually paid $36 million for his tulips, he's going to be very disappointed because he may get scrap metal 
value out of it, which might be $5,000, $10,000, some point down the road. It will, be it will be regarded as the biggest mistake this collector ever made. Blanche said that he was blind, so he doesn't even know what the hell he's buying. But this is the nature of contemporary art, the charlatans, the irrelevant artists, unless you're dealing with the most important part, something that is truly connected. He can say the words, but he has no understanding. He has no clue. And he is, he is part of this culture of deception, deceit, the culture of death, in the age of fission, as I have called it, that is destroying the fabric of our souls, not my soul, not anybody's soul that listens to me and understands what I'm talking about, but this is what we're fighting against, the coons, the schnabels, the sallies, the people that have been absorbed in this culture. Beware of people that are, that are successful in this culture. And this is a whole other video about success if I or anyone, any other artist of conscience would actually succeed, how do they handle that? How are artists of conscience actually going to handle their success? This is another, this is an interesting topic. I talked to Blanche about this a little bit. He's thinking about this as well. Not that we need to worry about this because people aren't interested in what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're staying alive, that's about it. Not like this guy who is, uh, he could have anything, he could buy, he, with the success that he has, he can buy a small country. He has a greater GDP in his own uh, business than uh, a country like Liechtenstein or Rwanda or something, I don't know, whatever. But, well, I think you get my point.